Enter the Long Box of the Damned 2023 Bumper Contest, if you dare. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon sponsored review time again, and here's a franchise we've never talked about on the show before. Back to the Future. On the slim chance you have never seen the Back to the Future trilogy, it's about Marty McFly, a teenager who is best friends with eccentric scientist Doc Brown. Brown invents a time machine using the short-lived DMC DeLorean car, which I think is part of the joke. I've driven a DeLorean before. Even for the few minutes I did so, it was not a comfortable ride at all. Man, I really need to get the Southland Tales crossover back up at some point, don't I? Anyway, due to shenanigans, Marty is sent back in time to the 1950s and accidentally prevents his own parents from hooking up, leading him to need to reunite them and successfully return to 1985. In the sequel, Doc Brown brings him into the far-off future of 2015, where he needs to keep his kids from turning into assholes. And finally, the third movie sees Marty trying to rescue Doc Brown, who has become stranded in 1885. It's a solid sci-fi comedy trilogy. Not the hugest on laughs, but lots of memorable lines and moments with, of course, universal praise to Michael J. Fox and Christopher Lloyd for their respective performances. I'm honestly kind of shocked we haven't had a nostalgia-baiting sequel in the last few years where, like, Marty's kids have to travel back to 1985 to fix something from the original movie or whatever. I don't really want that or a remake, just shocked it hasn't happened. But while the mainstream franchise has never gone beyond those three movies, it wasn't the only piece of media for it. Aside from video games of infamous or mixed quality, there was a short-lived animated series that took place a few years after the movies involving our heroes going on time travel adventures. It even featured early appearances by Bill Nye doing science demonstrations that Christopher Lloyd narrated over. I've never seen the show, so I have no idea if it's any good, but we're here to talk about comic books. Aside from a brief tie-in to the animated series, IDW started publishing Back to the Future comics in 2015, filling in some gaps from the movies, how Marty and Doc Brown met, showing the alternate universe Biff's rise to power after he got the future sports almanac, etc. And there was an ongoing series that lasted for 25 issues, and we're looking at a storyline from that series. Originally, Marty McFly was played by actor Eric Stoltz. One of the reasons why he was let go was because he was evidently interpreting the movie much more dramatically and intensely, rather than the mostly comedic and lighthearted mood they wanted it to be. In particular, he spoke of the tragedy of the ending of the first movie, that Marty returns to a 1985 that is altered from where he left. Sure, his family is happier and more successful, but it's a world that he is not familiar with. That version of his parents, of his entire life and history, no longer exists. And of course, you're not supposed to read that much into it. Again, it's a comedy. It's supposed to be fun. I make jokey nitpicks of these things I love, but ultimately, it's just not that sort of movie to be asking deep questions about memory memory, history, and who we are if our world has changed but we have not. Still, the creators of the comic must have realized, say, you know, there's a story you can tell with that. So let's dig into Back to the Future number 13 to 17, Who is Marty McFly, and see how several decades later they worked with those existential and philosophical questions. <laughs> We're 
We're covering five comics today, and honestly, most of the covers aren't that interesting, so let's skip to the story. This takes place after all three movies, and we open with Marty rehearsing with his band. Points for trying to make the lyrics and singing their own special font and word balloons, but as with all music and comics, it's hard for me to pay attention to it when I don't actually have any audio accompaniment. In any case, the more important thing is that the bandmates stop him when they hear the lyrics, confused about this being what he wrote the previous night. The lyrics were inspired by a camping trip they all took together, but the lyrics mention them taking the bus. However, the others point out that, no, they took Marty's truck down. In fact, him getting the truck was the inspiration for the trip at all. Look, this is rock and roll, not a documentary. It doesn't have to be real, but if you're gonna make stuff up, at least make it cooler. Taking the bus. Truly the lamest of transportation methods. Admittedly odd that they bring it up at all, since, as the bandmate said, it doesn't have to be 100% accurate, but it gets the ball rolling. Marty meets with Jennifer, his girlfriend, at the diner where she works. Jennifer was involved in the events of the second movie, so she knows all about the time travel and whatnot. She thinks his problem is just songwriting inspiration, but when he gets wrong how they first met, and consequently she has a different memory of when she first met his parents, it continues to make him worried. He looks over a bunch of photographs of him from years back, as well as his aunt's old wedding tape trying to see how much of it he remembers. He mostly remembers stuff, but some of it he only sort of remembers, and others he doesn't. His dad joins him on the couch. How much of your life can you remember? From when I was small? From whenever. I'm a writer, Marty. We observe and record. Dude, I've been doing this job for 15 years. I sometimes forget what episode I wrote, recorded, and edited last week. Also, for someone who observes and records everything, you seem to have forgotten that that one kid who helped you out in 1955 land you your high school crush and later wife looks exactly like your son. Marty points out that if his dad lacked the confidence to become a writer and college professor like now, things might have gone differently. Unfortunately, his dad doesn't really get it, just thinking he's referring to teenage hormones and Marty just feeling different overall as he grows up. They go for a walk and Marty tries to explain it without the details of his time travel. You ever think of what could have happened if you hadn't stood up to Biff? Well, I don't think I'd have married your mother, for one thing. Maybe you would have, but it would have been... Pathetic! Bordering on contemptuous for each other, as you cared more about some old sitcom than you did your wife recounting your early romance. Maybe you wouldn't understand how things got to be like they are, and the whole world would be different. We'd have different couches, Dad! DIFFERENT COUCHES! Marty addresses the possibility more as a science fiction writing idea. What would happen if someone's past changed and you never did what you did? Would you still be you, or would you be someone else? It's a deeply philosophical question, and George tries to approach it with how time would work via metaphor. Like a rock hitting water, it might create some ripples, but essentially the flow of the water, or in this case time, is unchanged. Thus, you'd still be you even if some things were altered. However, there is the idea of the branching timeline, that time can split into multiple different directions, this time using examples from a playground. Choose one slide, you end up at a completely different place than if you chose the other. And if you chose the metal slide, then you'll be in agony from this different place. So if time changed and you didn't, you wouldn't be the real you. If the timeline is always changing, did the future happen before the past? That means lunch won't be till yesterday. His father suggests that what he's talking about is predestination, that things will always unfold a particular way like it was supposed to. George decides to take Marty to see their old Catholic priest, Father O'Flaherty, and Marty asks about the concept of fate. If someone went back in time and altered your past, would you still be the same person in the eyes of God? Oh, Marty, it's a good thing that's not possible. There are no redos. That's fine for a story, I suppose, but the idea of it, of second-guessing the divine plan, of avoiding the consequences of your actions, that's blasphemous. I mean, you don't want to hear about what happened when King David got his hands on a hot tub time machine, Marty. It's an interesting idea that I think few, if any, time travel stories talk about. The religious implications of altering history. What that means for people's souls. It's mostly because, of course, time travel stories are generally science ones and not religious ones. But consequently, I really dig this angle. Marty being concerned that now he's going to hell for changing the timeline. Of course, the alternative was non-existence, and who knows what happens to the souls of people who don't even end up conceived because of wibbly-wobbly timey-wimey. I'd hope that God would be a little more understanding of unusual circumstances. But of course, even if Marty was condemned to hell, 
hell for his actions, what about his family? Their lives were unintentionally changed by what occurred. Do they get punished for something that was his fault? And even then, it still doesn't answer Marty's essential question. Is he really Marty McFly if his memories of the timeline are different than everyone else's? The Back to the Future universe doesn't seem to ascribe to multiverse theory. One timeline that is altered, with those who have time traveled retaining their memories in existence despite the changes because they've moved outside the bounds of the normal space-time continuum. I actually made a video about this back in 2011 that's no longer available because it was on Blip. The yarn ball theory of time travel. Anyway, point is, Marty's fears are legitimate and, to quote him, Whoa, this is heavy. These are all very interesting ideas about time travel, identity, and philosophy. Unfortunately, they don't make for very good jokes, so... Boner, I guess. When last he encountered Doc Brown, the guy explained a system he set up with pneumatic tubes that Marty could use to contact him should he need to. Since otherwise, he's off living with his wife and kids that he got in the third movie. As such, he considers contacting Doc Brown, but in the meantime, he heads off with Jennifer to properly explain his conundrum to her. That he's the same, but everything else changed. Or, I guess that's not true. You had a Marty, but Jennifer... I'm not sure I'm that same Marty. Admittedly, I still fit into that Marty's pants, so that's a plus. To further demonstrate his point, he uses that age-old bit of trivia about the first movie, Lone Pine Mall. In Marty's original timeline, it was Twin Pines Mall, he crashed into the second pine tree, and thus the name was altered when he returned. When he arrived back in 1985 to save Doc Brown, he saw himself go back in time again, but that was a Marty who always lived in this timeline always had a successful and prosperous family, and it was always Lone Pine Mall. Where'd he go? He didn't change the past. Well, in the case of the mall name, yes he did, he just didn't realize it at the time. That one became predestination for him. The timeline still required him to make those alterations, or else his version of history wouldn't have happened, and delivered him right back to the original version of events, and thus he'd be living in the altered timeline, and- I hate temporal mechanics. Jennifer doesn't really have much she can do to reassure him, so just kisses him and says that they're the same Marty who vanished. It's just a weird time thing. On the way back home, though, they pass by Doc Brown's house and hear the burglar alarm has been tripped. The cops are outside to investigate, and since they know that Marty knows Doc Brown, they allow him to go inside to switch it off and see if anything's been stolen. After turning off the alarm, though, Marty notices one of the pneumatic tube capsules is sticking out with a message inside of it. It's time we had a talk. A friend in time. You see, when two time travelers love each other very much, this leads us into issue 14. Later in the day, Marty and Jennifer talk about the message. Marty thinks it's some kind of stalking note for him, but Jennifer points out that it's just as likely intended for Doc Brown. Doc's out gallivanting around the time stream. He could have made enemies. Teddy Roosevelt did once mysteriously write that he was going to kick Doc Brown's ass next time he saw him. Gallivanting? I was paying attention in class. You might be right. I should be paying more attention to vocabulary lessons rather than time travel shenanigans. The two are soon accosted by a bully from the movies, Needles, and Marty briefly wonders if it's him who sent the message. But considering how easily he's outwitted at every turn, probably not. The person who left the message, though, soon identifies himself. Professor Marcus Irving, who says he's a friend and wants to talk to Marty privately. They drive to a storage unit as Irving explains that he knows Marty's a time traveler and that he's clearly encountered parallel universes and alternate timelines, and that indeed he might be in one right now as a result of all this. As such, Irving shows what he's been working on. You're trying to tell me you built a time machine? Out of a Yugo? Okay, but to be fair, Marty, the Yugo lasted a lot longer on the market than the DeLorean. His time machine is incomplete, and he tells his story. He was recruited by the military in 1962, shortly after the Cuban Missile Crisis. They wanted time travel as a safety net in case of an emergency like that went bad. For over 20 years, he worked on the project before finally getting fired the last January, though he admits the military probably would have abused time travel if he had been successful. He then learned that he was actually the Army's second choice. Doc Brown was the first, but he had turned them down. I don't know what aggravated me more, that I was a second choice, or that by saying no, Brown had condemned me to a life of fruitless labor. True, but you did get government funding for like 24 years. That's pretty stable employment, all things considered. He decided to try to find Doc Brown in the hope that he had the missing piece to time travel that he lacked. 
He denies wanting it purely for himself, instead thinking they'd share research or he might get inspiration. He found his laboratory, but Doc Brown himself was long gone. When he learned that Marty had worked with him, he went to go talk to the kid, but in the process saw the DeLorean arrive at his driveway and then leave again, disappearing in a flash of light. He realized that Doc Brown had indeed figured out time travel and then located Doc Brown's second lab, wherein he discovered the communication system for contacting Doc Brown whenever he was in time. However, he says they're running out of time. Specifically, Marty is, and that he's going to vanish. As we saw in the movies, time is a habit of correcting itself if something has changed, though not instantaneously. It happened with Marty and his siblings when he went back in time, his brother and sister vanishing from a photograph before he did too. Irving believes that since there was already a Marty living in this timeline, then that one will reassert himself and overwrite this Marty. Our hero wonders why Doc Brown didn't warn him about this. Because this was now a different Dr. Brown who was friends with and employed the other Marty McFly. Why on earth wouldn't he want that one back? Because Doc Brown is not an asshole and has routinely demonstrated that he believes very strongly in ethical usage of time travel and would probably try to figure out a way to save both? Irving wants his help, but lets him have some time whether or not he'll trust him to do so. That night, Marty has a nightmare where the Marty from this reality berates him for his place in the timeline, and Doc Brown being happy to have him back while he vanishes from existence. When he wakes up, his dad hugs him, Marty declaring that he'd do anything not to lose his father. It's not an important sequence, but I do love moments like this in the story. It reminds us that Marty does care about his family, regardless of whatever version they are. Marty sends the letter, and Irving gets out of sight. Never can be too careful. Too careful of what, Professor? Say, you wouldn't happen to be a villain, would you? The note said it was an urgent emergency, so Doc Brown quickly arrives dressed in a Hawaiian shirt, shorts, and mummy wrappings. Marty! Is it something from the past? Or the future? Or both? As you can see from my wrappings, I just got back from a fight with the greatest enemy modern-day America has ever encountered! Ancient Egypt! While Doc is distracted talking to Marty, Professor Irving slips into the time machine. Marty explains his fears about how he'll vanish, that he's not sure he's the real Marty McFly, that the one from this timeline will be returning. Doc says that he was expecting this because he had the same concern about himself. There was a Doc Brown in the alternate 1985, after all, who has ceased to exist. Hell, he also knows that the version from Marty's original timeline died. Did he die in a hail of gunfire? This bothers me. As a scientist and a human being, I admit I've always kind of wanted to get shot to see what it felt like, Marty. For science, I could ask myself about it. However, he admits he doesn't know the answer about the quote-unquote originals of them. Marty mentions Professor Irving, and Doc immediately gets worried. Great Scott! Come along, Marty! We haven't a moment to lose! You know him? From reputation only! He's another temporal researcher, but one without my clear sense of right and wrong. Additionally, his science is specious at best. Did you hear that he wanted to make a time machine out of a Yugo? What an idiot! Marty thinks there's nothing to worry about. It's not like he can make a flux capacitor in two minutes, only for them to find the DeLorean missing its tires and the flux capacitor. The issue ends with Doc Brown saying they'll find Irving, but Marty is then grabbed by duplicates of himself. Across the Marty-verse! Issue 15 picks up right where we left off. Doc Brown amazed by the multiple Martys. Great Scott! The time stream has turned in on itself! Space is warped and time is bendable. Doc tries to talk to them, but they just knock him down. Marty tells him to run, that this is all his fault and he's ruined everything. Nonsense, Marty! Just... I'll be right! I'm not getting any closer. It's called sequential art, Doc. Just wait for the next panel. Actually, it's because one of the Martys is holding him in place by the shirt, but he just discards the shirt and heads to the DeLorean. Fortunately, while the tires are gone, the hover upgrades they got in our old future of 2015 still works, and he flies in pursuit, though with a Marty grabbing onto the thing. While our Marty is dragged into a warehouse, Doc Brown continues his flight. At least from this altitude, I'll appear to be a simple helicopter. The human mind has a tremendous capacity to ignore that which cannot be. Easy, Doc. You're channeling Sylvester McCoy from the review I'm going to be doing in November. He recaps the plot for anyone just joining in, wondering if the presence of the other Martys means that the multiverse is real, and indeed in danger by what he did. He also spots a Marty that's trying to get in. Meanwhile, our Marty talks to two of his kidnappers and admits he knows why they're after him. He says that he went back in time and changed things, figuring that the one in a similar outfit as him must be the one from this timeline who went back in time. Doc lets the other Marty in, saying he doesn't want to see any Marty McFly hurt. 
Though this Marty doesn't seem to have the same concern. Speaking of Marty, Our states that the silent treatment he's getting is unbearable, and that if he's gonna vanish, then they might too. You lived your whole life and had dreams and ambitions and hopes, and I took that world away when I came back. Admittedly, by not changing it, then your world wouldn't have existed then, but really I'm the asshole here. But yeah, it's a lot of existential rambling and self-pity. It's all good stuff, especially as he wonders if the other Marty, whose hand is stiff, is one where he got into a car accident during a race with needles and broke his hand to the point where he couldn't play guitar anymore. You're a version of me who shouldn't exist. Yet you do. And it's all my fault. No wonder you want to get rid of me. So where's the Eric Stoltz version for the true original timeline? As the Marty and the DeLorean attacks Doc Brown, the scientist grabs his face and rips it off. Great Scott! You're not Marty! Jason Bateman, what are you doing here? Back with our Marty, he realizes that if they're all alive and around, then he didn't erase them. They have just as much right to live as him, and that means they have to work together to set everything right. And they still say nothing. Fortunately, the DeLorean crashes through the wall, and Doc Brown comes out of the car with a friggin' gun! And he zaps the other two Martys. Marty! I found a more efficient way of producing 1.21 gigawatts! He reveals that the other Martys are robots, no doubt servants of Professor Irving. While Marty and Doc head over to the third robot that had to be dropped out of the DeLorean, Irving and his servants arrive at the warehouse. Marty realizes that Irving was just messing with him about the other timelines and him fading away. Just a ruse to get the flux capacitor. However, the robot they came to find, since Brown has used its circuits to find the other robots and consequently Marty, has disappeared. Though they soon find it, being accosted by Needles, who doesn't see the robot face from behind. Needles his goons are idiots, so even when they see the robot face, they think Marty is just in a costume. Even when the thing starts using its strength on them, and it declares that it needs to eliminate all witnesses, ending the issue. This is my fault. Okay, Marty, I know you're still reeling from your dilemma, but I think saying you're responsible for the killer robot is a bit of a stretch. As we enter issue 16, the robot knocks out Needles' goons and drags him away. Despite what the thing said, Doc Brown doesn't think anyone would deliberately program the robots to kill anyone in the past. He thinks the robots are future tech because of the potential repercussions. Marty's not so sure given he's met Professor Irving. If he has a time machine, he could be recklessly gallivanting through the whole... timeline. Gallivanting? I'm pleased you're paying attention in school, at least. Although I suspect that in the year 2023, a spell check system in Microsoft Word won't recognize that spelling and go for Gallivant with an I instead! We do need to stop the robot. You wouldn't happen to have an electromagnet on you by any chance? Why would I? Marty, I don't know what a teenage boy in the 1980s does for fun. Especially because the Game Boy hasn't been invented yet. Marty decides to just tackle the robot and it drops needles, knocking him out. Doc runs in, but the robot shoots a dart at his arm and he falls over. Marty thinks that the robot killed him, but an older version of Professor Irving comes out to reveal that all it did was knock him unconscious. He admits to lying about Marty disappearing from existence and uses some kind of spray that'll erase needles and his friend's recent memories of encountering the robot. The older Irving shows Marty his younger self currently in the process of trying to escape any potential pursuit before going into some explanation of his evil scheme. Not all of it, but he admits he doesn't want his activities known, and being from the future, he doesn't want to risk killing someone whose presence is important to said future. He's become a recluse in the future, though also says that he can't leave Marty and Doc running around, seeing them as more dangerous to the time stream and himself with their reckless changes. As such, he takes the two back in time to the Pleistocene era, while he takes the DeLorean and himself to 1997. The supposedly delirious Doc mentions that they should try to not be eaten by a saber-toothed tiger, since their fast food diet will probably make them sick. Marty! I know we're about to be eaten, but I just ate at Wendy's! At least when we die, the animal that killed us will get its comeuppance! When Irving leaves, Doc recovers, saying that he actually woke up properly a few minutes ago and needed to make Irving think he was delirious for the trap he just laid. He's not worried about their current predicament, but Marty is downtrodden, thinking that maybe they deserve to be killed here for all they've done, even unintentionally letting Irving run around messing with time. Marty, listen! I hate to throw water on your argument, but that is the dumbest thing I've heard today! Why are you my assistant? Actually, they just leap in the water to escape the prehistoric animals, since he really doesn't have time to humor Marty's self-pity right now. Doc still has some of his mummy wrappings, which he uses to lasso a nearby rock. 
Those rejuvenation clinics do wonders. Do you have any idea how old I am, Marty? I'm basically a Time Lord from Doctor Who now, Marty. I just need to perfect my accent. They head up to a big flat rock, and fortunately for them, Irving soon returns with his time-traveling jeep. Doc reveals that his statement about the tiger got into Irving's head. He's trying not to alter history too much and cause a butterfly effect. Thus, Marty or Doc Brown could have a virus or bacteria that wiped out early civilization. Or if they saved a mastodon or something that went on to trample on the first proto-humans. Basically, if he's gonna kill them, he can't just leave it for wild animals to do the job. As such, they arive in Irving's little bat cave in 1997, full of technology up to 2008. My god, Marty, look! Two different generations of Furbies! They travel to the top of Irving's tower he owns, and Marty wonders how the robots have such detailed clothes of his. I found your photographs on the internet. The inter-what? I've heard of it, Marty! In the future! There's so much porn, Marty! So much porn we've never dreamed of! He even says a similar concept to the internet was a neural link in the year 2035, which... Just sounds like a bad idea. Don't put the internet in your brain, people, if that was even possible. Irving scoffs at going so far ahead. He's been taking baby steps into the future, only about 10 years at a time. It's not a bad idea, honestly. A while back on my Tumblr, I was critiquing the aesthetics of Star Trek Discovery and mentioned just how much technology can radically change in the span of 80 years. Even 10 years, there's still a lot of difference between 1990 and 2000, but you can see how one flowed into the other. Irving leaves the two in the care of an entire floor full of Marty and Doc robots, intending them to kill our heroes to end the issue. Our final part has Doc pulling out a device from his boot. He managed to develop a remote override for the androids right before they got captured, even mentioning it at the time, and now he's using a device to summon the DeLorean to their position. It quickly arrives, though is spotted by Irving on the way down. Marty wants them to go back to 1986 to stop Irving from taking the flux capacitor, but Doc thinks that's the wrong call. Acting without consideration is how they got into this mess to begin with. Even if Irving was lying about Marty erasing himself from history because of being from a pre-changed timeline, there could still be other timelines or a delay in time overwriting itself, and they need to be sure about what actions they take, especially if they want those effects to be instantaneous. Or they could end up creating a Bill and Ted situation where both parties are constantly going back farther in time to undo their opponents. Although I wish they cited Bill and Ted for that, Admittedly, Bogus Journey didn't come out until 1991, but come on. You've got to imagine Doc Brown would want to see other time travel movies to see how they worked. Deciding they need as much information about future Irving as they can get, they double back and head to his basement lab. As I suggested earlier, he's been making short hops to the future and reverse engineering technology, introducing stuff just a little bit earlier than it did originally and making a fortune off of it. Marty wants to look into the future to see if he becomes the real Marty, but of course Doc says they can't do that. They're already going to radically change Irving's future. Doc's only tried to look into the future to make sure Marty isn't hurt by his own actions, revealing that he carries his own own guilt about altering the future because he's the one who made time travel. Marty, however, figures out that the two of them look after each other while Irving has been all alone, even creating a creepy robot mannequin of his sister to tell him he's so awesome and deserves so many friends. Oh god, Irving is actually Lex Luthor from the Superboy show, isn't he? Marty explains that the two of them are not the only ones who know the burden of history being changed. Irving does too, but he's all alone, isolating himself to try to reduce the risk of damage to the timeline. But him spending so much time on his own is what drove him to meet Marty in the first place. With a plan ready, the two fly past Irving, exclaiming that he cheated by stealing Doc's invention and that cheaters never prosper. I mean, technically they do, it's just you're trying to prevent them from continuing to prosper. They returned to when they were shown Irving driving away with the flux capacitor. Future Irving arrives soon afterwards with his robots, much to the horror of his earlier self. Marty gets out of the car and explains that in the future, Irving becomes a lunatic, a kidnapper, liar, and thief. Let's not forget murderer, he was fully intending to kill Marty and Doc Brown even if he didn't pull the trigger. Irving admits his life was ruined by working on the time machine, every moment of his youth squandered, but Marty just says that as soon as he was free from the government, he trapped himself becoming a villain who's willing to send his robots to attack innocent bystanders, like the mother and daughter in the street nearby. Marty says that he knows who he is now because of the choices we make turn us into them. I'm me because of everything I've done, in any timeline, even the things nobody knows anymore. Those things make me Marty McFly. That and this vest. It's a very distinctive fashion sense that nobody does unless they're trying to look like me. Marty asks Irving what makes him who he is. Paranoia? Isolation? Loneliness? 
And with that, the past Professor Irving smashes the flux capacitor on the robot attacking the bystanders. He tells the bystanders that this is all his fault. He wanted the world, but he became a monster instead. The future Irving and all his tech vanish instantly. Although because of time shenanigans, that means the DeLorean's out of action again, and Doc is trapped until he can repair the time machine. Fortunately, 1986 is not the most hostile of eras. Stay away from 2020, Marty! 2016 to it are bad enough, but especially stay away from 2020! Irving talks with the woman, Gabriella, and it's clear they're hitting it off. There's a brief bit with needles as well, but nothing important. The more important fact is that Marty recounts these events to Jennifer in the diner, Doc and Irving along for the ride. Marty says that he may have overly extrapolated the idea he was going to hell from what the priest said, and indeed he's confident about himself now. Blessed to have lived two lives. Doc Brown asks for Irving's help in fixing the time machine, but he's more concerned about his date with Gabriella. Doc Brown hopes that he'll return the Yugo to the authorities Authorities, though not for the time travel tech, but the nuclear components. Not everyone can be trusted with unlicensed nuclear reactors! There are some radical scientists I need to go visit in New York soon, Marty! And so our comic ends with Marty saying that this has given him an idea for a song. Unfortunately, it turns out he just ripped off a Genesis song by accident. This comic is good, but the resolution to Marty's dilemma feels a bit pat. I mean, obviously there's not much one can do about it. Marty needs to find some kind of resolution to the ethical and philosophical dilemma. I mean, sure, he can find personal relief that he is himself, as he put it in the comic, but he still replaced a version of himself that technically no longer exists. I think what might have worked better is if he started remembering things from this timeline. Two sets of memories that he just resolves because a lot of them are similar enough that it doesn't matter. And it feels like he arrives at this conclusion very suddenly simply because he saw how the professor isolated himself. Maybe the idea was that Irving was so concerned with altering time that he shut himself off from living his own life and Marty saw a potential future for himself in that, but I don't know. Doesn't feel like that's what he was taking away from the experience. I do like that the resolution of the problem was about Irving becoming a better person rather than trying to stop him with violence or finding some way to get him locked away in time or whatever. He's an antagonist, certainly, but it's only his future self that's become a villain willing to kill, despite that most certainly having consequences for the future as well. After all, he said he found pictures of Marty online to base his robots on, but would those pictures exist if Marty wasn't around to post them? The story is also a bit too fast-paced in my opinion. I don't think a sixth issue would have helped, but maybe cutting the visit to Earth's past would have helped improve the pacing, since otherwise it's mostly action beat to action beat. Overall, a very good story and a sign of the quality of the Back to the Future comics. Next time, we're taking a break from Patreon-sponsored reviews to do a theme month. Long requested, eagerly anticipated, for August, Let's talk about Amalgam Comics. made a remote control for a flying time car? Don't be ridiculous, Marty! It's a simple recall mechanism! Homed in on the controller, that's all! Extremely dangerous! Unless you don't mind smashing everyone around you! Ah, oh, so Tesla auto-driving is still a thing in the future, I see. Hello, my friends! Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!